Two years ago, I began this YouTube channel posting videos of my progress coding a voxel ray marcher. The project has evolved significantly since that point. I've achieved amazing things, from realistic looking voxel physics to jaw-dropping render distances. But somewhere along in the process, the original ray marching part got dropped, I switched to using rasterization, which is the more standard, conventional approach that most games take. Recently, however, I've been looking to up the visual quality of my engine. I wasn't strong enough as a programmer two years ago, but since then I've studied algorithms and data structures, and learned what matters when it comes to writing high-performance code. So, after a lot of deliberation, I decided to completely scrap my engine's graphics and write a brand new, pure voxel ray marcher. The choice to switch to ray marching was mainly driven by one thing, how my voxels are colored. My past renderer used a very limited material system. The way I assigned a color to each voxel in my old renderer was sort of like the way Minecraft blocks work, right? Like in Minecraft you have a set of blocks, there's a dirt block, there's a stone block, there's a grass block, and each of those blocks have their own texture to them. But you can't dictate the individual block colors or anything, you just have to choose from the palette that is provided to you. And my voxels worked in the same way. I had some voxels which were assigned the dirt material, other voxels which were assigned the grass material, and then I applied a very simple 16x16 16 16 texture on top of each of those voxels. And the problem with that is everything looks the same when you zoom out or look far away. Like, if you look at these mountains in the distance, they're all just one color, they're gray, and there's no detail to them. Another huge drawback of this approach was that it made importing models very difficult. Because there are a lot of stock voxel models you can find online, which make for nice test scenes. But if I wanted to import a voxel map into my engine, I would have to assign each of the colors in that voxel map to a material, and I didn't really have a full material palette filled out yet, I only had like a couple of materials to find. So it meant that when I imported many models into my engine, they really didn't look very good, and so it was very hard to come up with nice example scenes to show off. It comes down to this. Having unique per-voxel colors and per-voxel normals is paramount to having a realistic looking scene with lighting. Normals are something I haven't really explored before, but it turns out that they're incredibly important to making good looking scenes. When someone refers to a surface normal in computer graphics, they're basically talking about the direction that a point on a surface faces. And this is important because it dictates how bright that surface appears. So if I take like a piece of paper, and I hold it up so that it's directly facing the light, the paper is very bright, right? But when I turn it to the side so that it's perpendicular to the light, the paper gets dark because not as much light falls on that paper per the amount of surface area that there is. You can encode this normal data into every voxel. These per-voxel normals are, I think, the secret sauce that help engines like Gabe Rundlitz and John Linz look so good. They make it easier to discern the shape of surfaces, and allow things to look really smooth and not blocky. Now, it's much easier to support per-voxel colors and normals using ray marching than it is with rasterization. In ray marching, the color of each pixel on one screen is determined by this little ray that you shoot through the world. You start at wherever the camera is in the scene, and you draw a little line out from the camera. Whatever that line hits, um, you just take the color of that object, and that becomes the color of your pixel. And this is great because you can use the voxel data directly while you're doing your ray marching. Whereas with rasterization, you have to turn the entire scene that you want to draw into triangles. 
If you have unique voxels, that means that you have to potentially generate multiple triangles for every single voxel, which can get really performance intensive and inefficient. So with this in mind, I removed the existing graphics backend and all of the voxel data structures from my engine. I removed over 11,000 lines of code and began re-implementing everything with ray marching. The new Ray Marcher has a number of improvements over my initial attempts from two years ago. This includes things like support for an arbitrary number of non-grid aligned objects and levels of detail. But the most profound improvement, and the thing that I'm happiest with, is the reduced memory usage. One thing I've learned over the past two years of working with GPUs is that GPU memory is really slow. I mean like really slow. So you want to minimize the amount of memory reads that you do as much as possible. My original Ray Marcher used a voxel octree, and so every time the Ray took a step, moved forward in the scene to check if it had hit an object yet, that meant doing 8 or more memory reads to traverse down the octree. I tried to cache some of the data, but that meant that I was using up a lot of the GPU's registers, or basically like local memory, and that wasn't too good either. So I redid the data structure that I use on the GPU in order to do ray marching, and vastly reduced the number of memory reads that I need to perform. I'm still using a tree-like structure, but instead of an octree, I now use a tree which splits each parent cube into 64 smaller cubes, so each axis is subdivided by 4. I'm not sure if there's an official name for this kind of a tree. I guess you could call it a tetrahexaconta tree? <laughs> THC tree? But um, for now I'm just going to call it a brick tree. The core of the Ray Marcher works the same way as before. The scene is organized into brick trees, and when it comes time to cast a ray out into the scene to determine what color a pixel should be, the ray moves through the scene and moves through the higher levels of the tree first. So if a region of space has no voxels in it, that level of the tree is not subdivided, and the ray can move through that entire cube without needing to check any voxels inside, so it allows for a form of empty space skipping. But there's a secret, something that's allowed me to really leverage the architecture of modern processors, and that would be bit masks. This is a 64-bit number where each bit represents whether the child node in this tree is subdivided or not. And so what happens when the rays are moving through the scene is they'll get to a tree, They'll read the 64-bit bit mask, and then they'll start stepping through each child node. And when they get to a child node, they don't do any more memory reads to check if the child is empty or not. They use this bit mask, which is just one or maybe two registers, and they use bitwise operations to select the bit that corresponds to the child node which they are currently in, and they check to see if that bit is set or not. And if it's not set, the ray moves on without performing any memory reads at all. This means that my rays can take up to 10 ray steps without needing to read from memory again, which is a huge performance win. As a showcase, here's a castle scene from a teardown map which is rendering at 7 milliseconds per frame with a primary and a shadow ray on my GTX 1660 Ti. Notice how smooth the rocks appear now, by the way. This is the power of pervoxel normals. I haven't optimized the ray marching code or the ray marching loop at all, and I'm not doing any other fancy optimizations like a depth prepass. So this performance is all just coming from the empty space skipping and this bit mask acceleration structure. So I think I should be able to improve the frame times even more because I have a hunch right now that I am compute bound. The end result is that I can now load any voxel model that I want 
and it looks great. From teardown maps like this one, to 3D scans of real-world places like this church. If you want to try out the Ray Marcher for yourself, you can use it in browser and um, check out the church model. I also will put a link in the description to a Google Drive folder where I will post all of the other models shown in this video. You can download them and then uh, import them into the engine and try them out. For those who are worried that I'm giving up my goal of supporting integrated GPUs, don't be. Another really neat thing about ray marching that I probably should have thought about earlier when I initially switched to rasterization is the fact that there's a really easy way to improve the performance of a ray marcher, and that is simply to render at a lower resolution, like this. And so this is a scene running in real time on my integrated graphics card, and this is all done using ray tracing. Yes, it's low quality, but I think that's a fair trade-off, right? The graphics won't be held back um, while I try to support low-end GPUs, but hopefully the game will still be playable, just at a lower resolution. And honestly, I mean, I think the lower resolution looks kind of cute. Everything's made of cubes anyway, so it, it has a certain charm to it, but maybe I'm just making excuses. Um, anyway, the next steps that I want to pursue are I need to add back um, destruction and placement of objects. And then, of course, there's even more optimization to be had. Thank you very much for watching. Please leave a comment if you had any questions, and also let me know what you thought of the new video style. I'm trying to take a more unstructured approach to things, because in the past, creating videos has become like a really big, daunting task, and I don't want my YouTube channel to be about the videos. I want it to be about the voxels, because that's what we're all here for at the end of the day. So if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to see where I take the project in the future, and have a lovely day.